room. So I can start the day by welcoming you again to this uh, final day of uh, AMERCI, the, the school uh, sponsored by IEEE GRSS on advanced methods for remote sensing information extraction. Uh, and so, yes, uh, today we, we end, the, end the school with uh, uh, two sessions uh, as usual, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. The first one in the morning will be a talk given by uh, Dr. Maria Piles from the uh, University of Valencia. And then in the afternoon, we will have uh, a different uh, setup with respect to the other days that we, that we spent together. Uh, so we will have at first a panel debate on artificial intelligence and remote sensing. And uh, in that uh, there will be several experts and uh, scientists uh, um, attending and uh, um, pro uh, putting, uh, putting material into this, uh, this discussion. Uh, among them, uh, Maria will be joining us uh, uh, again. So thank you again, Maria, for all your effort. And uh, there will be Klaus Petersen that I see uh, linking in now, uh, from, uh, that is the uh, CEO of NORA. And there will be Paolo Gamba, the uh, president of the Triple GRSS, and Ronnie Ansch. Welcome, Ronnie, from uh, DLR. But uh, in any case, uh, we will give an introduction later, uh, later today. And then finally, uh, there will be uh, a talk on, uh, on multimodal remote sensing to conclude the school. Um, for now, uh, I just uh, would like to introduce uh, our next speaker. That is, uh, as I mentioned uh, during these days, again, another, uh, one, another speaker will uh, like fasten your seatbelt uh, CV. So again, uh, uh, welcome to Maria. Uh, Maria Pires uh, uh, from the University of Valencia. Uh, she has a PhD in signal theory and communications uh, awarded in 2010, mastering in remote sensing. Uh, she was a research fellow at Melbourne University in 2010 and a research scientist at the uh, Universita Politecnica de Catalunya in 2011-2016, associated to uh, MIT. Uh, since 2017, she's a senior researcher at the Image Processing Lab at the University of Valencia in Spain. She has been uh, actively involved in the scientific activities of the uh, two first uh, space missions dedicated to measuring the Earth's soil moisture, uh, the European Space Agency's uh, uh, ESMOS and, uh, and the NASA's uh, SMAP. Uh, her research activity is centered in uh, microwave remote sensing, uh, retrieval of land bio biogeophysical parameters, and development of multi-sensor syner synergistic techniques uh, for applications of ecology, agriculture, forest conversation, and a better understanding of climatic phenomena. She is deeply involved in the development of uh, machine learning approaches that allow extracting and interpretable inter information and knowledge from Earth observation data. She is a member of the Mission Advisory Group of the Future Passive Microwave Satellite Mission for EU Copernicus, CIMR, and she is a senior member of IEEE, and she is currently serving as, as president of IEEE GRSS Spain chapter. And, uh, and she uh, is, has been also uh, co-organizing uh, this, uh, this school uh, or, or with us. Um, so, as I said, this was a, a fasten your seatbelt CV, and uh, now I just uh, stop uh, sharing my uh, screen, and I uh, give a floor to to Maria for this uh, incredibly interesting talk uh, that uh, she will give us uh, in the first session of uh, of today. So, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. Yeah, for being here, it's my pleasure to participate and organize this school together with Andrea and Salua. And uh, let me see. What? Oh, one minute. I'm having uh, some problems. This one, okay. See if there's something. Okay. I don't know why they're asking me for a power to. Okay. Oh. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, we, uh, we can uh, see you, no. we can hear you, but okay. uh, we cannot see your screen. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. We just tried just before. Okay, now we see your desktop. You see my desktop? Okay, then it's okay. It's okay? Okay. Here we are. Good. Here we are. Sorry, I don't know. Something weird happened. Okay. Uh, so, um, I'll be talking today um, about sensing soil and vegetation water from, from space using radiometers. Uh, but first of all, I just wanted to break the ice a little bit. So Andrea introduced me very well, but just we we'll go very quickly through my uh, through my trajectory in the sense of all the people that I've been I have that I have had the pleasure of working with and that they 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 have helped me a lot and then um, I use all the all the knowledge that I acquired with them into this presentation. So I think it's worth. Let's go through it. So after studying uh, telecommunication engineering, oh, let me can I change? Yeah, This is it. Okay. After studying telecommunication engineering, I I went to do my PhD at UPC with Carlos Lopez. He also did it. Um, He's at UPC now. My mentor was Adriano Camps, and I, I went, uh, I dived into the small mission, the small motion ocean scientific mission, all the aspects of the mission. And that was a super, super uh, nice experience. As a, as a PhD student, I visited also the, the MIT, I visited Professor Darren Tekavi, um, and he, he's the principal investigator of the SMAP mission, so so moisture active passive. So I've been deeply involved in the two space missions dedicated to soil moisture measuring from space. Then um, I, I joined as a postdoc at Melbourne University where I participated in the calibration of the calibration and validation of the small mission. So it is it is very challenging when that uh, once that the mission is set up set on space. Um, we need to see that everything is working and that all the algorithms and uh, all the parameters are just set up so that we can provide the best possible product. And, and then there's a lot of uh, different field experiments around the world. So I joined the experiments there. And it was also very nice. I'll talk about that later in the presentation about the validation of the missions and how to, how to address that. And then after this period, I, I was working for, for six years at the SASMOS, Barcelona Expert Center. That's, a, um, that's an expert support laboratory for de delivering uh, small products. So again, like from the from production, like, uh, and from a production perspective, I'll be talking about the retrieval of parameters. And, and then uh, since 2017, I, I, I joined the University of Valencia and I joined the, the group of uh, Gustavo Camps Weiss and they are experts in uh, artificial intelligence applied for earth, to earth observation. So I, I found they, they were my perfect match to, to explore these techniques. And at the, at the very last part of my presentation, I, I'll introduce some ways in which uh, artificial intelligence uh, can, can really provide insight into the data and the process understanding. So here is the outline of my presentation. I just provide a quick uh, perspective on where are we in the remote sensing and geosciences. Um, then I'll go into microwave radiometry. I'll, I'll start with the physics, how, how radiometers work and how we measure the, the Earth and its activity. Then I'll go through the passive microwave space missions that have been launched and are able to, to measure soil moisture and uh, also uh, future missions in which I'm involved. And then this is a, the, the backbone of the presentation is parameter retrieval, how we perform retrievals once we have these excellent uh, sensors on space. And then I'll talk a little bit about multi-sensor synergy. So instead of using just one sensor, and information from one sensor to to address a problem, just use the information from several uh, several sensors, so so that we, we get um, an improved um, improved kind of results in, in terms of product or applications. And then in the, la the last um, the last uh, section, I just saw a flavor of how machine learning and remote sensing can be combined. 
Um, just, uh, just to start and to give a perspective, um, there's been uh, transformative changes in measurement technologies. So if you think, if you think of it, uh, uh, at, the, at the beginning, we were able to measure um, your physical parameters on the ground only. Then we started to, to build remote sensors that were able to capture the electromagnetic spectrum and the properties of the different ob objects from the distance. Those sensors were initially ground-based and then were put on airborne. So that, for instance, this is an example of agriculture applications, the uh, precision agriculture that we can uh, we can benefit from airborne sensors and also drones. And uh, once the technology is mature enough and we're able to send those sensors to space, then we can actually have synoptic views and we can have high temporal resolution and monitor our, our planet, monitor the, the different variables or orbitals of, of our planets. So I think um, remote sensing and geosciences have been going hand by hand and uh, there's been transformative developments uh, for geosciences thanks to remote sensing and the other way around. So just uh, to give an example of how I see uh, the present situation of climate emergency that uh, satellites or satellites can help and can greatly help is for instance if we look at the record of micro satellite instruments that we've had, we have since the launch of the first one 40 years ago, uh, we can for instance measure the sea ice thickness and the sea ice thickness is, um, it has an annual variability, so it's, this, this is like the annual cycle, but this the minimum um, is about uh, in September and the maximum is in March, about in March, but you can see this is a clear trend and we can see this clear trend that it is, uh, it is being reduced. And in fact, uh, I put this, this picture from, from a colleague uh, from the Danish Meteorological Institute, they, they go to, to Greenland to, to get, uh, well, they put on some sensors and they went there, they went there to um, recover those, those sensors ground base. And when they went this year, last year in June, they just, they just found that there was no ice to measure, it was all water. So it was for the first time ever. So it means there's actually important changes. That's, um, in the Arctic, and it's it's something that that we can uh, we need to monitor, and that that's why there's there's different initiatives uh, for for understanding this this new possibly ice-free Arctic situation. Uh, so this is uh, another example of um, of how uh, how we are addressing this. Uh, this kind of emergency, especially in the Arctic, and it is a mosaic expedition. I I invite you to, to visit this page. This is an amazing initiative. Uh, it's an international collaboration to monitor the Arctic, the Arctic and there's, uh, there's been uh, many people involved and they've been there for a year, including the pandemic, so <laughs> imagine. And they, they, um, there they had a lot of remote sensing instruments and also in situ instruments and they, they were um, they were collecting a lot of information and data so that we can better understand the processes. Another example of, of the, how we can use uh, remote sensing data and the combination of the different satellites um, <clears throat> to, to deal with the climate changes or climate emergencies is for instance, you can see here the synthetic aperture radar being, being used for uh, monitoring floods in Mozambique last year. And then uh, regarding the wildfires, uh, in Greenland, which were really, uh, it was the first. And then in the Amazon, there's really worrying uh, fires. There's different perspectives. So you can see also, you can analyze the gases in the atmosphere. You can actually see how the, <clears throat> how the fire is moving and this information can really uh, help the, the people that is fighting against the fire and also understand the, the impacts of the different phenomena. Um, okay, so this is just to my perspective is that, and I think the perspective of many of us is that now we are in a golden age of fast observation. So we've been able to, okay, to have um, a, a constellation of satellites measuring many variables of the Earth. So from the atmosphere, methane, 
evapor evaporation from the land surface and also the ocean. And we have this data and this data is generally like they, they have a three day revisit or a weekly revisit or even monthly, okay. But then um, we have it specialized so we can say that we have kind of data cube in which each variable has the space and time dimension. And with the time, we can focus in, into, into investigating the, the changes at the seasonal or an, at interannual scales. We looked, uh, we have an example of that in the presentation. And then since, since we have different variables, we can, we can just represent the different variables together as an hypercube. But see, this is a great amount of information. So it is also a challenge to be able to deal with all, with all the data and be able to extract the, the information. But um, the data is there and then we have just to develop the, the mechanisms and the methods to exploit the data and use it for good. So just after this introduction, I just focus on microwaves. So microwaves are, are good for, for getting popcorn, <laughs> but also uh, microwaves can be used to, to measure the, um, the, the, water, the water content in a volume of a material. And today uh, we focus on water volume of soil and also of the vegetation. But let, let's go to the physics. So uh, radiometry, is the field of science and engineering that that measure the the electromagnetic radiation. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. We, with our eyes, we're only able to measure this portion of the spectrum, which covers the visible light. Okay, and then we can take pictures. And then if we have a nice camera, we can get like the three bands, red, green, and blue, and start to combine them to get properties, uh, different properties of the landscape. And then if we move uh, to the infrared uh, part of the spectrum, um, I'm sure you've seen this, this kind of cameras, especially now in the, in the pandemic. Yeah? Where cameras are used to, to see whether you have the fever. So it just, uh, you can see that the hot spots in the images. So it's related to, to temperature. Okay, and then if we go to the microwaves, which are um, broadly used for wireless communications, and also, as I said, the microwave oven works also in these uh, frequencies. Um, we are able to measure the, um, how dry or how wet um, the soil is. So I, I focused in, in this presentation on the passive sensors. You, you saw with, with Carlos Abik and Alejandro, you were working on the active sensors. Uh, active sensors emit, um, emit the signal and receive the signal. And that is the signal they process. With uh, passive sensors, we just measure the natural emissivity of the earth. So uh, any, any, um, any body that is at a physical temperature greater than zero Kelvin emits, emits in all the electromagnetic spectrum. And if we, if we go and capture the emission at the microwave uh, optimal band, we will be able to, to extract the, the soil moisture. So uh, I need to introduce uh, the black body, the black body is um, in, it's an artificial body. It doesn't exist, it is, but it's a body that it's a material that absorbs all energy and re-emits all the absorbed energy. So this concept of black body is, is useful because it, we will use it as a reference to measure the brightness of any, any body of, or, or material. So uh, it was blank that uh, introduced the concept of the uh, black body. And uh, also he, um, he developed this theory and we call it Blanc's law. And this is the radiation uh, of, uh, of a body, which is a 300 Kelvin, that would be the earth in, in red, uh, in, in black, sorry. And in, in red, you have the radiation of the, uh, of the electromagnetic, the brightness, the electromagnetic radiation of the sun in red here. 
Okay, so you can see that the visible um, visible part of the spectrum is around here. The infrared is around here. And if we go to the microwaves, it looks good because you can see this uh, almost a linear relation. And we will use it to simplify a lot the, um, the, um, the transformation of the, of the, of the um, black body reference to, to what we actually measure. So also this, uh, you see here in this equation, this is the black law. And this is the approximation of, which is called Rayleigh genes. Because if we do, uh, if we use Taylor and we say that this exponent here is very low, we can end up with this simplified version of Planck's law. And this is the one that we will use. So the, this would be the brightness of our black body in the, um, in the microwave region can be expressed as this, where T is its physical temperature. But then, since there's not such a black body, what we say is that, okay, the brightness of a given material, um, you can express it as this, and we introduce the concept of brightness temperature as the temperature that the body does it, that is emitting will have, so that um, the, no, the brightness that a black body will have, so that its brightness is equal to the emitting, uh, to the emitting uh, body. Okay, so this is like a reference. And then we can express the, um, the emissivity of, uh, of a material as the brightness temperature divided by its physical temperature. Okay, so we express it as the brightness of the material with respect to the brightness of the black body. And, and then we, we know that the brightness temperature, the, um, the emissivity is, is bounded between zero and one. So the brightness temperature of any material will be lower than its physical temperature. And this is the actual magnitude that is captured with the radiometer or with the passive sensors. Okay, so this is um, our, uh, it is here. So the, the emissivity is greater than zero. A zero emissivity will be a perfect reflector and the one emissivity will be an ideal black body. Okay, so this, uh, this will be very useful because we need to understand what brightness temperature mean and that's, that's the actual measurement. Uh, so brightness temperature is the emissivity multiplied by the physical temperature. Uh, so in here, um, we explain what the, the quantity that the radiometer, the radiometer measure is a brightness temperature. And the brightness temperature for a dry soil is much higher than the brightness temperature for a wet soil. And then we will use this difference to uh, this range of difference and this sensitivity, we can say, to actually retrieve the, the soil moisture content of the emitting, um, of the emitting soil. Um, and then there's um, this angular variability, which we will use in the instruments that provide angular variability. So uh, for instance, SMOS has a wide angular variability. SMOP only has 40 degrees, which would be the optimum to to capture the difference between the two polarizations. So this is vertical and horizontal. So you have to choose one angle to reward 40. But if you can have the different angles using synthetic aperture, uh, then you can exploit all, uh, all that variability too. Okay. Um, okay, here. So just um, to, to define what is actually soil moisture as we measure it, is the volume of water and with respect to the total volume. So if we go to centimeter, it will be the centimeter, cubic centimeter of water per cubic centimeter of volume. And then a pixel will be, uh, it will be the whole pixel, the whole volume that we're measuring, okay? And then it can go from very dry, which will be zero, cubic meter per cubic meter, to very wet, which will be around 06 cubic meter per cubic meter. And then in, within the soil, um, you have like some soil particles and air. And then as you add water, the water fills in those pores until the saturation. And 
the, the dielectric constant of a material is the property that determines how it responds to an electric field. And in particular for soil and vegetation, it depends primarily on the fractional volume composed of water, which is exactly what a soil moisture in, in the case of the soil. So what fraction of this volume is occupied by water? Okay, so that's the dielectric constant is actually um, when we will be able uh, to retrieve with the microwave sensors because the microwave sensors are very sensitive to changes in the dielectric constant of this soil. And this dielectric constant, if you see it in here, it increases monotonically with the soil water content. Okay, so this, uh, these are um, field experiments from the 1980s. So this is not new, but the first space mission to measure soil moisture was launched in 2009, which was SMOS. And this gap is mainly due to technology and uh, I'll go to that later to see it's, it's very hard to put on space um, an antenna that is able to record uh, low frequency microwaves. So you can see, let's go to these curves. So we can see that, of course, the texture influences this relationship of the dielectric constant with moisture. You can see sandy soils, silt soils, clay soils. And you see here on the right that the particles within um, in the on a sandy soil are coarser and they are finer as you get to clay soils. So this, this will have a, an important impact in the relationship. And, and also the, the temperature. Uh, at which the, the soil is. And here in number, uh, here it's a L band, uh, which is one uh, microwave frequency, which is actually the optimum. Uh, I think there's, a, there's been an agreement that it's the, optim the optimal frequency to measure soil moisture. And this is all the frequencies that are not as optimal. See, in 1.4, you see the maximum variability between the minimum, between low and high soil moisture. That means there's high sensitivity, a little bit high sensitivity. This is C band, a little bit in each band, but still C band um, has a interesting variability and we can also retrieve soil moisture from C band. It's also, also, also later on. Okay, so this is uh, the concept of this slide. The important concept is that we measure with the microwaves. Uh, microwaves are very sensitive to changes in the dielectric constant of the soil. And, uh, and this dielectric constant depends on the fractional volume, volume that is occupied by water. So that's all I'm sure. Okay, and other characteristics, uh, especially this one, is very interesting for many applications. And this is um, as compared with the optical bands in which the atmosphere is not transparent, and you have to accurately de detect where the clouds are. And, um, and then sometimes you, your measurements just uh, get masked by the atmosphere. In the microwave, the atmosphere is nearly transparent. So we will have um, continuous monitoring. Uh, of the earth. Um, and then we're, we're sensing the soil emissivity from the top five centimeters. We're working at L band or uh, shallower, um, shallower depth if we go to higher bands such as C or X bands. Here is, um, I represented the different frequency, um, frequency bands in microwaves. So L band is uh, the coarser you see uh, longer, wave, longer wavelengths. And then as you go to higher frequencies, the shorter wavelengths. <clears throat> so what happens if we have vegetation? Then we have to think of what is our, um, our the frequency band at which we are operating. So for instance, we're interested in retrieving, in retrieving, the, in retrieving the soil moisture and we're using an L-band sensor. It has a wavelength of around 20, 27 centimeters. And, and that means that all, all, compo all plant components which are smaller than 27 will be transparent. Okay, but we'll still uh, be sensitive, we'll, we'll still be sensitive to the presence of, of, uh, of the trunks and the stems in here. But we'll be able to, to measure uh, 
so it comes to the soil emissivity about, at about um, the whole earth except for the dense forest, very dense forest. If we go to X band or C band or X band as a stream, uh, the elements uh, which have a size of around three, three centimeters are already blocking the soil emission. So the leaves. Then when we have like uh, sparse vegetation, we can, the, it is sparse and it's, but it has leaves at this size, then we won't be able to measure soil moisture under vegetation. So that's, that um, strengthens the idea that the L band is, is optimal in that sense too, because we want to measure the soil moisture ideally in the whole planets below all kinds of vegetation. And then if we look at the other side of things, if we're interested in the vegetation, um, then we need to take into account that the vegetation components emitting at L1 will be the, tree, the trunk and branches at L1, and a fixed one, it will be the, the leaves. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, the microwaves are, the, are also used for other applications such as mobile telecommunication, mobile communications. And uh, L band uh, is the only one which is protected from RFI. That means that it's protected and not this, uh, an operator can just place the, uh, the network to, to work uh, at these frequencies. <clears throat> yeah. Can you hear? I hear something. No question, no? Okay. Uh, oh. There's something in here. Is there any band that can penetrate more in the soil, more than five centimeters? Okay, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. Thank you, Monse. There's P band, which is uh, even uh, longer wavelengths, which can penetrate deeper, around, uh, yeah, 50 centimeters to one meter. Also, I have to say that this is on average. So dry in the, when the soil is dry, you have a deeper penetration and but the, when the soil is wet, you have shallower penetration. So this is on average. And still, if you're thinking of um, root zone, which is around one meter of this sea here, um, recent studies have shown that uh, the anomalies that occur at the, this um, depths are correlated with the anomalies that occur in the surface. So that means uh, we have some capabilities also to uh, to get like these these high dramatic changes in the um, in deeper soils. Okay. Um, I think I answered your question. Hopefully. hopefully. Okay, uh, regarding the radio frequency interference, I, I just wanted to highlight the, uh, the great effort that the different space agencies are, are now, um, are now uh, conducting into going to the International Telecommunication, um, International Telecommunication Union conferences and try to protect these bands that we use for Earth observation. Uh, because as you may guess, there's a lot of commercial interests and a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of money around the mobile communications and everything. So they have a lot of power, but it's important that we keep those bands. Otherwise, especially since we, we're using passive sensors, we um, we are very vulnerable to other emissions, which are not coming from the soil or coming from you know um, mobile network or anything. So, yeah, but so far so good. These bands, which are the ones we mostly use, are safe. Okay, I'll just go to, uh, we'll go on a, on a route to, to see the passive micro space missions. So I can just imagine you like this, relax and, and enjoy. The two first space missions measuring soil moisture, they both have been designed to have an L band radiometer, so passive. Um, sensor on board. Uh, actually, it's being called sometimes a water frequency channel. So the first mission that was launched is SMOS, Soil Moisture Ocean Salinity. It was launched in 2009. And uh, this is uh, 
very particular satellite because of its Y shape. So it has three arms of three, more than three meters each. And uh, it's composed of three segments. The three segments were just um, folded and then they open up once the satellite was, was on, uh, on orbit. Uh, a total of 69 receivers are, um, are laid in this uh, antenna structure. And uh, this is done to imitate, um, as an, it is, it is um, used as an array so that it can uh, synthetically build uh, the effect of a very big antenna. So for, uh, a disk antenna, it's a, a disk antenna of, of uh, six meters, it's not possible to, to put in space. And then uh, one idea is to, to use a small antenna on the right side. And this is, it was inspired by radio astronomy. So you can see here, this, this is the VLA, the very large array in the US. So they use um, an array of different antennas to measure, uh, well, to synthesize a big, big antenna and be, be able to measure uh, radiation from very, very far away. Um, a question from Stefan. Is it possible to be feeling shade first return, second return, etc., similar to LIDAR? Uh, not exactly because there's no return. There's only an emission that we're able to capture. It's like uh, we're just uh, listening to the earth with our ear. We're not sending any, any pulse as in LIDAR or uh, or radar, okay? But we'll, as uh, we see in the modeling part, you need to account that the soil emissivity, it can also um, go into the vegetation, go back to the soil and go up to the satellite. So all these different uh, scattering effects, we have to take into account, scattering and attenuation, but there's only one emitting source and that's the earth. Okay, and the other satellite that was launched was uh, SMAP in 20, 2015. And that's an um, interesting alternative. So instead of, okay, um, a disk antenna of six meters is not feasible to put on space. You cannot fold it and, and put it on space and open it. Uh, one approach is to synthesize the antenna, SMOS. Um, and the other approach is the, the one of using um, a lightweight mess. Uh, this is an electromagnetic mess. This is a, a very state-of-the-art cutting-edge technology. So you can actually build an antenna with the adequate spacing so that it appears as a solid antenna at your operating uh, uh, frequency. And then if you build it, as, uh, as you can see it in here, and then you can fold it as an umbrella and it can open uh, one sits in the space. So, uh, as I told you at the beginning, I started my, well, I did my thesis and I worked a lot with SMOS mission and this Espresso Paul Laboratory. So, this is the day of the launch. This is me here a few times ago, a few years ago. And then it's the launch. We made this event to follow the launch live. It was from Russia, so we were not able to all to go there. And uh, as most is an Earth Explorer, I'll go to that uh, in a minute. What is an Earth Explorer? That, that means um, it's just for space exploration. It's the first time that a synthetic aperture radio meter was put in space. Although we, there, there were a lot of tests on the ground or with, also with a flying sensor. This, it was the first time that this technology was actually going to be tested on space. So this is an Earth Explorer. And it was supposed to, it was, its design life was uh, from three to five years, but you can see it's, it's more than 10 years that we have it there uh, working. So it's, uh, it's uh, been a great success. And about the orbit, most Earth observation satellites work on a low Earth orbit because uh, you want a hybrid visit and then they, they go through the poles and they cross the equator in particular, the, the ones that 
um, measure soil moisture. They are designed to cross the equator at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And that's beneficial from a modeling perspective. So there's a thermal equilibrium between um, the soil temperature and the vegetation temperature, and we can benefit from that at these times. So the um, global risk is three days. From SMOS, the two main products are global maps of soil moisture and over the oceans, ocean salinity. As a third, I would say that we've discovered it's also very useful, the other one is also very useful for to measure sea ice, sea ice thickness, and many other variables. But those are the main objectives of the mission. And then this instrument that I was uh, telling you about is called MIRAS. It's a two-dimensional synthetic aperture radiometer for observation. It was the first time. And um, it, ha it has a very particular shape. It's a synthetic aperture, so it takes like a, a picture. And every few seconds, it takes a picture of the Earth. And in this picture, what we call a snapshot, uh, the information has different properties. So, uh, for instance, this is one snapshot, and the incidence angle range is from zero to 60. We saw in the other slide that there's a dependency with the incidence angle. So, uh, we need to take into account the incidence angle of each observation in the in the, the snapshot. And also, you see the circles in here have different shapes and spatial resolution within the uh, this snapshot is different. So it ranges from 30, which is the best special resolution in this bluish area, to uh, almost 90 or perhaps 70, 80. 90 would be like the very stream around here. So where the pixels are very elongated and the special resolution is, is worse. Um, the soil moisture active passive mission is built on a very different concept. So it, it has um, a radiometer that uh, is a real aperture radiometer and it's conical scanning. So it goes around it. So its direction is in, in this direction. Okay, this direction. And it keeps on spinning and measuring, spinning and measuring. Okay, as you can see here. So there's only one incidence angle would be 40 degrees. It's also in a 6 a.m., 6 p.m. Um, lower orbit with a three day visit, uh, it swaths. So from, from this part to this part, the swaths that covers in each circle, it's of 1,000 kilometers in its mass. In its, in its mass, it was almost it's, uh, 1,200. That's okay. Similar swaths that allows you to have a three day visit at that orbit. And then the interesting thing as map is that it has a radiometer, but also a radar with the, uh, an airborne radar, an airborne radiometer with the idea of merging the two instruments and reaching a uh, higher spatial resolutions. Also, uh, it was designed to measure soil moisture and freeze soil uh, state at high resolution from the radar. And also there's uh, actually there's um, ocean salinity product as well. Um, but the problem was that the, unfortunately the radar failed. So we only have two months of data. And that's a pity because we have, well, there was a lot of algorithms ready to test and then two months was, uh, was really uh, not what we expected, but the radiometer is perfectly in health. It's in good health, it's working and operating very well. Uh, since there's a lot of overlap in the different passes, there's, um, there's a product that, that's radiometer only that is being produced at nine kilometers. And instead of using the radar that failed, now SMAP is using Sentinel-1. Um, Sentinel-1 is a C-band radiometer. It's not an L-band, but and it, has, it doesn't have, it's not collocated and everything. So there's, there's some differences, but there's, um, there's a product that they, they that is being provided at, at one kilometer from from the from SMAP and combination with uh, all the sensor active sensor so um, I would say that it's also a, a successful mission in spite of this. So this is okay. I wanted to put an animation. Okay. 
So uh, this is from the smart, the small bus, the small bus and bicycle centers, so different maps. So it's it's amazing that since the um, satellite was launched, we were receiving at the center facilities the the information in very near near real time. So every day we were, we were getting the swords. And now we have a very nice collection of data. And you can see here, I, I put this animation to, to stress the fact that you can see here the snow data. That's because when there's snow, when there's snow on the surface, we cannot measure the soil because we're measuring the ice properties. We're not measuring the soil. So the soil emissivity is totally masked when there's uh, ice. And we take that into account in the retrieval. And then you see the variation from zero to zero six as we said before. And then uh, I just wanted to introduce the different levels, processing levels that are usually in for a given mission. We always have like, there's the level zero data. That's just the counts. So bits and ones and zeros and everything. That's that's generally only stored by the, by the space agency. That's not, uh, that's not available because it's, uh, it's not of much use until you just actually are able to measure from there. You actually go to brightness temperatures, which is the physical magnitude that we use. That's a called the level one. And that's distributed normally. And then the different uh, retrieval algorithms are run to provide the level two products. Level two products are on a, on a swath. You can see this is not the whole globe. It's just the places where the satellite passed at that particular day. And then the different passes of the satellite are combined into level three maps, which are just gridded maps. And they, they are generally, you, you would choose a, an aggregation of three days, or 10 days, so you can get uh, a map of the, of the whole Earth. So this is time averaging. And then there's level four, the level four, um, um, the level four is related to products that use the um, use the data from this mission, but also uh, fuses it with data from other sensors or models. So this is um, usually called level four, with which in small sense map uh, level four is is uh, is useful trying to get highest possible resolution. Um, this is from a climate perspective. So I'm also going to recognize as an essential climate variable in 2010. So this is the different variables that have been uh, recognized that are essential for climate advances in the, the atmosphere, in the ocean, and the, and the um, land. Okay, why 2010? Why not before? Because for one variable to be selected as a um, an essential climate variable was selected or just um, defined as a, an essential climate variable. The observation needs to be relevant, but also the observation needs to be cost effective. So we should be able actually to measure it, to be able to use it in climate studies. In climate. Um, and this is why um, it took a little more so much to, to reach this, this stage. Okay, so this would be technically feasible and also cost effective. So until 2010, there was no space mission dedicated to, to actually so much your measurement. We were not ready. And, and from 2010 onwards, we are. And there's, uh, there's been a, um, a super effort um, in building um, climate data records for all these variables, including soil moisture. And I'll go to that now. So we have small sense map that were launched in here, 2010, 2015. Those, um, oh, that's a question. Can the data be used efficiently for evapotranspiration? That's Sadeha asked. Um, so I'm not sure can be used efficiently for evapotranspiration. That will be, that will depend on the model that you use. Uh, to take soil moisture into account to retrieve evapotranspiration. transpiration. So that I would say that depends on the model and there's, there's different um, works pointing into that direction. 
that the soil moisture data can be used for that. Um, Zhang Chi Lin asks, how does the quality of the brightness temperature data compare between smalls and small? Does the soil moisture community have any preference? <laughs> any preference? So um, uh, I would say that the smalls is a little bit um, noisier because it's a synthetic aperture radiometer, but we are uh, at a very good compromise because we have different incidence angles. So the end product um, is meeting the, target, the, the science requirements, which is an accuracy of 4% in soil moisture. And SMAP um, has a high radiometric sensitivity. It's a real aperture radiometer. There's no problems with, um, with the image reconstruction. Um, and it's also meeting the target requirements. And indeed, the, the good thing would be to use the two, the two of them. So the community, I think, is using the two. Perhaps it's more since you need longer time records. Uh, and SMAP, if you want to go to higher resolution, only with the radiometer, because as I said, SMOS is now providing a product at 25 kilometers and SMAP at nine. So it may make a difference in some of the application. Um, so coming back to this, uh, this overview of the different satellites that are, these are the satellites that are being merged in the Copernicus Climate Change Service Soil Moisture Quartet. So there's this initiative in which, okay, we only have L-band studying in 29, but we need to, to try to, to leverage from all the microwave sensors that have been launched on space and we have the, the data uh, so that we can also um, analyze the, the past and then we'll have 40 years of records. That's, that's really needed. And for that reason, uh, all the sensors that were not designed for soil moisture measuring, uh, but had a C band, especially C band or X band, uh, such as AMSER E and AMSER 2, especially these two, they have they have proved to be very very valid and useful for for soil moisture retrieval as well. Also, WinSat those uh, operate with C band, and then if you go uh, if you go to the 1990s, 1980s, we can also use SSMR and semi. Of course, the quality of the products is not uh, as good and ideal as the one that we have now. Um, but uh, the, the general idea is to, to make the best use of all the data we have. So if you have no data, it's better to have you know, some, in, some indication of how the state of the planet and so moisture at that day. So we use the idea is to use all these sensors from the passive side. This TMI is, um, is uh, with a different design because it's, it's not global, but it's, it can also be used for the regions that well, it covers, it's a tropical. And then uh, this is the, the blue part is the passive, but also there's the active part. I won't talk about the active part much, but uh, uh, at ASCAD, a scatterometer and a scatterometer is not synthetic aperture, it's a real aperture and has been proved to be to provide uh, very useful soil moisture maps as well. So it, did not, it does not retrieve uh, quantitatively the cubic meter per cubic meter. It actually retrieve, it, it, it focuses on the change detection. So from the minimum and the maximum, you have a percentage, but then you can, uh, you can convert it to um, with the right information on porosity and soil, you can actually convert those values to uh, volumetric units and then be able to merge all the products. And, uh, and this is what is, and Sentinel-1 is also here, it's not yet included in the, in the mission because it's uh, far more challenging to, to deal with synthetic aperture radar for soil moisture estimation. But uh, I think at some point we will be able to use it as well and to, to improve and leverage from all the sensors for the, for the climate data record. It's available on the Copernicus actually. Once you go to Copernicus, um, it's CCC service. Okay, you, you'll find it. And then for the future, in Europe, there's the, 
Copernicus Imaging Microwave Radiometer. That's that, uh, the mission that I'm currently, um, I'm a member of the advisory group for that mission, that it, it has passed its design phase and now it's, it's going to be actually um, we're going to be implementing uh, the, um, the industries have been selected already for the um, for different aspects. We will look at it, the different the technology challenge, because this, we need a uh, consumer a specific needs and uh, a specific needs also for CIs. And that means a uh, eight meter antenna. So this is a challenge. But the idea that we will have continuity for the soil moisture record um, and when it, when Timber is launched. And then JAXA, JAXA is also planning to build an answer three. It's not totally confirmed, but at some point I think that we, we won't have a gap. We, we really don't want a gap here. So some details about these uh, Simmer instruments. Uh, the Simmer instrument, um, it actually responds directly to the European Arctic policy. So uh, what I explained at the beginning of the be ready for a nice free Arctic. So prevent the anticipated gap in capability. So actually, um, SMOS is an Earth Explorer. It's not operational. So in Europe, there's not an operational microwave satellite covering the low frequencies. And, uh, and this, is, um, this is a capability that we want to have in Copernicus. So uh, this goes in this direction. So continuation, enhanced continuity, but also high spatial resolution. So um, it's a multi-frequency radiometer. It, it has uh, from C, CX, uh, L, CX, K, K, U. And the, the, high, the higher frequencies have up to five to 15 kilometers. That's because that's the resolution required for the CI thickness measurement to be able to, for instance, for uh, routing uh, capabilities in the Arctic. So many variables that can be estimated from this mission, including land surface variables such as soil moisture. Uh, they will be useful for uh, Copernicus services. You can see here atmosphere, the marine, because of the ocean sanity also, sea surface temperature, land, climate, emergency, and security, so all of them. And then we have this web page in which there's more information, and there's also the mission requirements document which is called MRD, and it contains all the specifications of the mission and all the details, and, and uh, it's uh, the final version is, is there. Ready now is the industry that needs to build it, and the scientists that will work on the algorithm design, not the instrument design anymore. So it will be a fully operational system, and that's very nice. That means operational, not exploratory, operational, so we can trust that it will be there. Um, there will be two satellites, seven geo design like each. So um, we can engage, for instance, um, weather services into this kind of, of product because it's not three years as explorers, but it's more than 10 years. So that it's, it's worth the, it's worth using the data because sometimes the uh, operational services they don't want to use data which is exploratory they kind of trust that it's going to be there so they have to change all their system to adapt for new data and then perhaps the data is not being provided anymore so the idea of, of uh, this satellite is to be fully operational and be used for uh, all the backbone industries and other services Okay, so uh, the launch is expected for 2027. So from an L-band perspective, we had small and SMAP having an L-band. There was the Quarit mission, uh, was, which was uh, on space from 2011 to 2015. It also had an L-band uh, radiometer and a meter, but it was, um, it was designed for measuring sea surface sanity and it had a very coarse resolution. But still, the data we could we show that we could recreate so much as well from this mission. So uh, let's include it in the in the picture. So the small surprise map and the similar uh, in the in the future. So about the Copernicus, the Copernicus um, system. 
and there's a um, there's the science mission at well all, in Copernicus the central part of Copernicus is the earth observation missions and data so there's um, all the science uh, missions from ESA those are the earth explorers so small cc there was a second one see and then uh, the last one which is um, we'll select these two uh, Biomass and flex are the next ones to be launched. Uh, yeah, we are here. And then there's the Copernicus, which are the operational ones. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the different sentinels. So these sentinels, and we are sentinel six, okay, in here. And uh, there's, another, uh, there's the meteorological satellites on another, uh, on another branch, which are more focused to the uh, meteorological and atmospheric sciences, and those are, are, are led by ESA and EMETSAT. Copernicus is more European Union and science is fully ESA. So in the future, uh, there are two more Earth Explorer to be selected, and there's at least six high, high, priority, high priority missions, in which there's this Seamer mission, and there's also an L1 star, in which Carlos Lopez is involved. And there's a um, hyperspectral um, polar topography measuring CO2 and a high resolution land surface image. So these are the six, the six future sentinel, sentinel expansion. So a lot of uh, exciting capabilities for the future. This is a video. Can you hear the sound? No, Maria, Maria, no, I don't think that we can, we can you hear, the hear the sound. Okay, anyway, you can see the images. It's just the different companies that are trying to build the antenna. Yeah, so you see how difficult and how challenging it is, but yes, we're getting ready. So in this part, we'll just focus on the parameter retrieval. What does that mean? It means to estimate the actual, um, the actual variable we're interested in from the satellite measurement. And to do that, we have, um, we have a set of variables that, is, that, that describe, uh, for instance, the uh, soil, the land surface. And then we have uh, a radiative transfer model um, that taking those values of the variables are able to imitate the uh, brightness temperatures that will reach the the satellite uh, the satellite sensor. Okay, so we call it we call that the forward problem. And then to estimate actually the variables, what we we do is the inverse problem. So from the satellite observations, we go and using our model wisely, we optimize for the value of the variable we're interested in. Okay. So as you see, we need, uh, we need this radiative transfer model. It will guide us to go from the variable to the observations. And that's the first part that I'll, I'll cover now. OK. So uh, the, the most used physical model for um, land surface microwave radiometry is a, the, it's called the tau omega model. And uh, tau omega are the variables describing the, the vegetation interaction, um, the vegetation layer, okay? So this is a simple model which just considers one layer of the soil and one layer of the vegetation. And that vegetation is described with the vegetation scattering albedo, which is omega, and the vegetation optical depth, which is tau or VOD. So that's why this, this model is known as Tau Mega model. So let, let's look at, at what this model um, what this model simulates. It simulates um, the brightness temperature emitted by the soil directly. Okay, that is attenuated uh, by the vegetation if there is vegetation. Then this uh, it accounts from the, for the brightness temperature that is radiated directly from the vegetation. So this is this term here. 
So you, you can see this gamma is transmissivity and it's directly related to VOD. I forgot to put that formula, sorry. So this actually, this is attenuation and this is scattering, okay? And this is the um, temperature of the vegetation. And then there's a third term, which is the interaction. So this is the radiation from the vegetation which goes downward, it's reflected by the soil, and then goes upward and it may be attenuated by vegetation if there is. Okay, so this is, um, this is the, the model, the radiative transfer model that we will use. I'm going into details. We have, in, uh, we have um, soil temperature and vegetation temperature that are the satellite overpasses we assume to be in equilibrium or we adjust into an effective temperature. But this is one thing that we absolutely need to know the temp plant surface temperature. Um, and then for the for getting this, um, this is the reflectivity. And in there, there's, the, there's the, um, the electric constant. And the electric constant is related directly to soil moisture at Wilson. And then there's the soil roughness and soil texture. So we need this, we need this information. We need soil moisture. We need to know soil roughness and texture. We need to know temperature. And from the vegetation, we need to fix these two parameters, which are uh, scattering and attenuation. And with all this combo, if we know these five, uh, five, six variables, we will be able to imitate the brightness temperature that will reach um, the satellite. Okay. So to develop the value of the, uh, the value of these, to to understand how to fix, for instance, these two variables, what's the impact of the different um, different variables in the bandless temperature and emissivity and everything. There's, um, there's been a lot of effort along the years uh, to work with in-situ data. So for instance, we sample the vegetation here, we're measuring, uh, we're actually using destructive techniques, we measure the different uh, particle sizes, and how it attenuates and scatters, and then we use um, uh, we use sensors to see how the vegetation is affecting the, the emissivity. We also take measurements of soil moisture with the hydro probes. And actually, this is a very convenient way they had in Australia, which was like a pole in which you had the soil moisture probe um, uh, at a stream. And then you had a PDA in here in which you could just um, record your position. And also you could uh, add like properties of, of the, the area you were measuring, right? Like the kind of vegetation or any other interesting information to, to be taken into account for the, for the scientific discovery or the modeling. And uh, uh, this is uh, an automatic stations that are also placed in different parts of the world to, to measure soil moisture with solar panel. This is actually me, but uh, I am protected. Um, I, I have this protection so you can't recognize me. So you have to, we have to automatically to download the data um, periodically from these stations. They were not totally automatic because we were in this campaign, we were in the middle of the Australian, um, well, it was, yeah. Pretty, there was very few people, mostly kangaroos and cows. Okay, and then the, this is a, an instrument to measure soil roughness, and it's very curious because it's actually it, it's it's made of different bars, vertical bars. They all have the same length, and then if you put it on top of the soil, you, you get a profile, and from that profile, you take a picture. And then you compute the standard deviation of this profile, the different properties that we use in the soil roughness. Also, there's uh, more sophisticated tools for that, like a laser profile. So you put the laser and you define the, the, the spacing for the different uh, measurements. And so different, the, there are different um, instrumentations to do uh, all these kind of, um, of measuring. I have a question. How to differentiate the types of horizon or the pedological profile? Actually, since this is surface of moisture, it's it's very shallow. You will 
you will just account for the soil texture. And that will be that will be enough. So the dielectric uh, models that we use, they take as input uh, soil texture and soil temperature. So it uses soil temperature, soil texture, and soil moisture, and you get a dielectric constant. So we, we don't require information of the pedological profile. Hmm. Um, okay. So regarding the field experiments, so you can see here there's, there's different approaches. These are the different field experiments I've been involved with um, while I was at UPC. We had this Elbant automatic radiometer um, that it was, um, it, we could put it on a platform to measure different incidence angles. Remember, SMOTS had different incidence angles, so we put it in there and we, it, it was pointing towards different soil textures in the experiment. Here we were like looking at the effect of topography in particular. And here we were looking at the effect of roughness. This was soil roughness. So we were, then um, there was this track that we used to change the roughness and then we measured. We measured with the radiometer and with this laser profile. And, and this is to, to measure the a bind yard. And we were able to follow the development, the, the progress of the different, um, vegetation that we had in there. And this is for calibration. So for calibration, uh, microwaves radiometers need to be calibrated with uh, what we call a hot load and a cold load. So for a hot load, we, we use a microwave absorber. As it is an imitation of a black body. And for a cold load, we look at the, we look at the sky. So that would be during the calibration. So there's a lot of effort into this forward modeling. So we tried to model soil emissivity because we needed to soil moisture for soil moisture estimation in the end. So we are studying the influence of soil texture, roughness, rotation, topography, different things. And there's also um, airborne measurements uh, with different um, different sensors, radiometer, uh, different radiometers that we could also use to cover. Uh, to cover more heterogeneity and uh, and look at the scaling scaling issue and how the algorithms work, how the formal model works uh, when you when you are at a, on, on an airplane. And then next step is satellite. So this is in preparation. Okay, so for for soil moisture retrieval, um, what we our objective is to go from the measured brightness temperature, so the level one product, okay, to the soil moisture estimates, which will be our level two product. And for that, we have the observations of the satellite and we produce the different model estimates. This is the Tau Mega model. Um, we fix all the parameters we know, and uh, like, um, like the, we fix the soil roughness, the soil texture. We know the soil temperature. We take it from the national weather, well, from European Center of uh, Weather Forecasting, and uh, and the Tower and Omega for the vegetation. We approximate them as best we can, and then we are able to adjust the soil moisture variable so that it optimizes the difference between the observed and the models. And then we can, you can do this manualization in different ways. So this is, uh, you can use the development one-word algorithm, you can use that in the same different approaches, but in the end, what we do want is to minimize this difference. So the better your forward model is, the better, the closer you'll be to, to retrieving accurate estimates. So hence the importance of, of the radiative transfer model. So once you have the soil moisture, um, the soil moisture estimate, this is, uh, this is from the SMAP. Yeah, this is from the SMAP. So you have this very nice uh, map, different variability, but you want, you want to validate it. You want to see, especially in this commissioning phase after launch, you want to validate it, so there's a lot, there's a full strategy using all the in-situ networks that are, that are deployed. So this is from the International Soil Motion Network. 
Uh, this is a very nice initiative in which all the in situ probes that are having or are recording the soil motion measurements have been harmonized, unified with uh, the same format. And also there's been um, a quality filter has been applied to the data. So it is a very uh, important source for validation of, of the satellite products. And then you just compare the in situ soil motion, which is here in Xi'an, with the different versions of the algorithms. This is uh, two different versions of the algorithms. And you see which is the one that uh, that works best and you compute the different metrics. Okay, so this is more or less how, how it works. So you need to validate the, the model that, uh, you need to validate how you approach this minimization, how you fix these parameters, how you compare it with the observed data and how good are your estimates. And so the mission objective, I mentioned that before, um, the small and small mission requirements is to provide global maps of soil moisture every two days with an accuracy of less than 4%. What does it translate to actual validation? It's, it's hard because we have point scale measurements and we have satellite footprints. If this is, imagine 25 kilometers versus let's say like Five centimeters. What's the representative? What's the representativity of a, of a ground measurements and one single point, one single station? It's hard to say because it depends on many factors. So um, there are different approaches to do that, but generally, what is done is you compare when you compare with in situ, you calculate correlation, room mean square error, center room mean square error, where you um, you subtract the, the bias to the in-situ and the bias to the SMOS and you compute the room mean square difference and the bias. Okay, so um, this 4% will be related to the center room mean square error. And you want that to be uh, complete for all the probes that you can have. And that's the, um, and that's, that's more or less how it's, how it's performed. And as I said, the accuracy is uh, spectacular. So we're actually reaching that accuracy. Um, but there's all the, also other strategies for validation because as I said, the in situ data has representativeness errors. So then uh, measurement systems uh, are noisy and biased in general. We need to keep that into account. So there's the in situ, which is not the absolute truth has also a, an error and a representative issue. There's the satellite that we're going to validate. And there are different models, not the radiative transfer models. I'm, I'm thinking of land surface models, um, a climate reanalysis, so different models that, that provide uh, soil moisture as a result of uh, coupling different systems of the earth, for instance, or also of um, land surface model the surface models is like a forward model, but from what for that includes the, the land and and also couples with the atmosphere. So there are different soil moisture products coming from models uh, that we can also use for the validation. So there's um, these approaches that try to use not only in situ but also models for the validation are called triple collocation, and those are very very powerful and have made us make the community realize that there's um, how to best validate the different approaches and the products. And for the way of looking at the, um, how was the behavior of the soil moisture data um, and to, to gain uh, trust into that the product is, is, is well uh, calibrated and everything is to look at other variables that we measure, for instance, the precipitation. So um, this is um, uh, this is for our uh, presentation. Um, this is for for a, a presentation uh, that I just wanted to illustrate how soil moisture relates to, to precipitation. So um, I just took different boxes like in the U.S., Midwest, Iberian Peninsula, in the Sahel, and in the Gibson Desert in Australia, and I just averaged the soil moisture that I got um, every day. And um, and I 
I computed it for, uh, for many months, and then I compared it with the precipitation data that we had collocated. So you can see this is in, in the Aveyron Peninsula. So of course the rainfall uh, comes from the in situ, uh, from the in situ probes. So perhaps in situ probes are not representative either, but we need to differ that and we just compare them anyway. So we have here the soil moisture and the, the soil moisture in blue and the precipitation in, in black. And you can see that it corresponds pretty well. So there's this, there's this peaks in soil moisture and this exponential decay. It's a good agreement. And the Sahel, um, it is very nice because it has the, the two seasons, the wet and the dry season. The wet dry season, and it follows pretty well. In the Gibson Desert, although it's a desert, there's also very um, intense precipitation events. And you can see that it also, it also follows it very well. And then we went to the US Midwest and we found this pattern was not in agreement. And um, see, there's actually higher soil motion when there's no rainfall. And actually, that means that we are actually capturing a phenomena which is not directly related to precipitation. And in this case, is that the Mississippi River is being um, extensively used for um, for irrigation. Okay, so from this uh, study, there's, there's a lot of powerful um, there's a, a lot of information that is encoded in the soil moisture data and that we can use. For instance, situation is very hard to model. And then um, recently there's, there's some projects from the European Space Agency that I know of, and perhaps others, which are actually uh, providing uh, improved uh, rainfall and improved uh, irrigation estimates from SMOS. And uh, yeah, as I said, the signal encodes also soil motion memory. So how how quick, how slow is this decay? I go to that later. There's a question. I have seen the density obtain soil moisture from the network is very sparse. How to deal with the accuracy of these global data? Yeah, it's it's very challenging. We there's different approaches. We just we normally average. Since the satellite is, it gets uh, an average of all the pixels that are contained within the field of view, we average all the in situ that we have at that, uh, that pixel. If we only have one, that's uh, information that we have. We also account for land cover heterogeneity, for instance. So the more homogeneous the area is, um, the most representative the in situ. Uh, the in situ measurement is. So actually the uh, soil motion networks are designed so that with uh, perhaps with 10 probes, the, the average are consistent with the average of the 25 kilometers. So they were placed in different land covers, they take into account the soil texture. So there's, there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different approaches, um, but I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to this, yeah, this not only in situ is the way to go, I think we need to use the models as well. It's super hard to, to validate with, uh, with very, with point scale measurements, it's very hard. Yeah, but this is a full uh, field of research. I yes, just wanted to provide an overview and just continue. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to jump to another stimulating research line that um, that is nowadays with uh, microwaves, and it's is that actually um, at the beginning we just we were just uh, interested in soil moisture, and uh, vegetation was actually something that we just wanted to adjust somehow uh, so that we got the best soil moisture. So. Um, for instance, optical data was, was used to um, as an approximation of this BOD or attenuation. But then we noticed that actually we could develop advanced retrieval approaches that estimate not only the soil, but also the vegetation properties. And those vegetation properties could actually be useful for 
ecology or for many applications. And we started to investigate that. I particularly work with the SMART team. So we only had a 40 degree incidence angle in here. So to be able to retrieve these parameters, um, we, we needed more information. So we developed this framework, which is called degrees of information. We have this in here, in which given a, a set of measurements, what is the, the maximum degrees of freedom that you have. So we, we learned that we needed to, to use two, concept, two consecutive overpasses of the satellite to be able to retrieve soil moisture for each overpass and one single vegetation descriptor for the two overpasses. And that was a reasonable assumption because vegetation doesn't change very quickly. And, and hence we were able to, to provide, on one hand we have the soil electric constant from this, you, uh, we extract this soil moisture. And then we have the POD, the, the attenuation. We, we look at the information that we extract from here. And then we also have this um, scattering parameter that at the moment um, it's, we consider it to be static. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at this POD now. Because uh, as I said, there's been a change of paradigm and also in SMOX, there's now, uh, there's now a BOD product from SMOX. In SMOX, there's different incidence angles, so it's a different approach, but still the, 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 this parameter is, in, is, being, is being explored and investigated and there's a lot of useful information that can be extracted from it. So, um, the vegetation properties, actually biomass and water content mainly, are related to the microwave scattering and attenuation mechanisms. So these are video and BOD, especially BOD. So we can potentially reach those biomass and water content estimates from BOD. Okay, and actually we, we could actually look at plant water stress. So for that we need we need a lot of modeling and a lot of research. Um, still, but that, that's that's one of the, the objectives of the SMART smart, smart, smart missions at the moment. Uh, so we are really here. So need of advanced retrievals that use a horizontal and vertical polarizations, multiple angles if they're available, multiple, um, and multiple overpasses if that's needed, and also work with the different frequencies. So if we, if we for instance, for the Zimmer mission, we can actually look at properties of the leaves and properties of the branches of the trunks. So that's, that opens up a lot of interesting research. And then from the, um, actually the BOD, what is, it's, it, it, um, it's actually the attenuation of the soil emission when it goes through the vegetation. So you see, it's, uh, this is the illustration in here. And this attenuation depends on the water content of the vegetation and its biomass. Okay, and that's actually, there's the attenuation of the soil emission, and there's also the direct emissivity, which depends on the biomass and water content. So this, this all goes back to the tau Merha model. And this is the tau that we are estimating. So let's have a look at these VOD maps. When we had a look at the, the VOD maps, you can, you can tell that those, the highest values are here, where the tropical forests are, and uh, it, then we went and we went and obtained this vegetation height uh, product um, from NIDA. And we looked at the spatial patterns corresponds more or less, and then we were actually, if you look at the, this is the temporal averages of the BOD, uh, temporal average, and we compare pixel and pixel, pixel against pixel in this scatter. And you can see this uh, pretty, pretty good linear relation. And that means that SMAP is actually related to the tree height, which is the first approximation for biomass. So this is the signal in there. And we could also differentiate between the dry tropical forests, which are here in, represented in, in red, and the border forests. We could differentiate those in this black here from the tropical forests, which are the highest values and the highest trees, which are the blue ones. So this is the 
two info, the two kinds of information are kind of um, intertwined in the in the BOD, water and biomass. This is another exercise I wanted to show you because um, we wanted to, to look at the, these dense tropical forests and to see whether uh, what, what is the sensitivity to this BOD to different, to very high values of carbon density. So this is a little base also, but it's uh, airborne. Okay, so the, this is uh, Central America in Panama here. Colombia, Peru. And this is the, the BOD and from its map at nine kilometers. And we also compare um, C band and X band from Amseri. So you can see if you compare the BOD based the above, above brown carbon density, which is more or less can be approximated by half the biomass, you see that the relationship between the two is not linear but it doesn't saturate that much. But it is actually the correlation coefficient is pretty high. And if we go to C band, C1 and C2, which are the two of um, C2, you see that it actually saturates at about 100 uh, more or less ACD. And uh, here it's almost the same value. As you go to, to C band, it actually there's no sensitivity above like 25. So it's, it's uh, promising, uh, the use of l band. it seems to be promising to, to capture uh, these, these high values of biomass, which by the way, uh, optical data, which is also used for biomass, is saturated at high values, so it's complementary. And of course, with the synthetic aperture radar, we'll be in the same situation. So radar is, um, in terms of electromagnetic uh, bands, is the, the, powerful, the power of the different bands is it's very similar, it's actually the same. So with the L band radar, we'll be able to, to sense this to a higher spatial resolution. Okay, so then I'll just go to, um, to introduce um, an approach for to use the synergies of different sensors, and in particular, how to use the synergies to improve the spatial resolution of small data. So yes, to, to cite Aristotle that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's actually what we want with uh, when we use synergistic approaches. There's a question. If the measure, is the measure of thermotranspiration become more easy using radar data than optical one? Uh, it depends on how accurate, I guess, it depends on how accurate the soil measurement is and what's the special scale that you want to work at. For a medium resolution to coarse scales, I will go to passive microwaves. Um, because the uncertainty in soil moisture is lower. Uh, but the radar could be, radar and optical would be, would be the way to go if you absolutely need high resolution. So, yeah. Again, evapotranspiration, it needs a modeling from the soil moisture data. So it, I guess the measure of evaporation, evapotranspiration, it also relies a lot in the input data quality, but also in the model itself, in the model that you use. Okay, so, um, Okay, I forgot. I wanted to put a scheme in which, um, in which the soil moisture, uh, the soil moisture, called soil moisture, um, it's uh, beneficial and it's being used for climate uh, studies, for hydrology studies, uh, large scale studies of crops and everything. But when you go to do precision agriculture, for instance, if you actually need uh, and spatial details at the order of meters, and this, um, this is not enough. But uh, we, we saw that what different approaches there exist, that it's reasonable to go to one kilometer from the um, passive microwave course data. And I'll, I'll just introduce uh, the approach that uh, I worked, uh, or I'm still working on uh, at the Small Barcelona Center. And um, as an illustration, 
And uh, since it's MOS, it's only having one instrument, it's only having a radiometer. Uh, we exploited the synergies of SMOS with optical data. And in particular, we'll use balance temperatures and soil motion on one hand, and we'll use land surface temperature and NDVI uh, information, which can be extracted from, from optical sensors. In the case of SMAP, I won't go into detail for SMAP, but SMAP is more focused into using the synergies of passive microwaves and active microwaves. Because in essence, that's, uh, that was the actual um, initial design of the instrument. It had um, an active and a passive. But for SMOS, let's, let's, uh, let's look at how these synergies can be exploited. So actually the build that I saw today, it's actually being produced at the SMOS back uh, as a level four product. Ah, okay, this was the slide. This was meant to go first. Okay, sorry. Uh, as I said, spatial resolution of small and smart and all the other missions like uh, scatterometer and AMSER and AMSER 2. They are about 25 kilometers, let's say, yeah, 25 kilometers, and they are good for climate, for numerical weather prediction, for hydrology to some extent, okay? But they're not enough for disaster monitoring, agriculture, or forestry. And senior one, question resolution is around here. And also the advanced, uh, the advanced side will be around here. So uh, what we want to do with the synergies is try to keep the temporal resolution. Temporal resolution is also important, but we are satisfying, I would say, temporal resolution requires for more, for more, required for most applications. But we're not, um, we're not meeting the spatial resolution. So we'll try to go in this direction up to this line, which is one kilometer. Okay. So the, the link of, of soil moisture uh, with, mm, with NDBI and land surface temperature, and it's based on the so-called universal triangle. And it's based on the idea that if you, if you plot the scatter plot of land surface temperature against NDBI, I'm not sure why that the axis disappeared. It's okay. If you plot the scatter, it, it, it takes the shape of a triangle. Okay, and the, uh, the position in this triangle is related to soil moisture variability. Within the, the so this is a scene in which you have different, uh, this is a, a scene, you have different pixels in there, you plot the NDVI and the land surface temperature of each one, and you plot the scatter in here. So um, it's in high resolution. The good thing is that NDVI and the uh, land surface temperature, we have it in high resolution, and it provides an indirect measure of soil moisture, uh, soil moisture variability within the scene. So um, here would be what is called the dry edge. Okay, and this is called the uh, the wet edge. There's uh, NDVI. When NDVI is maximum, there's less, there's, there's less sensitivity to soil moisture changes. When there's, we have bare soil, there's higher variability, as you see, so higher sensitivity. So we will exploit, so th this is um, the universal triangle technique. Um, uses optical data, NDVI and TA, and that's the temperature to estimate soil moisture in indirect, indirectly, using this kind of formula. Okay. I tried that. I tried that. The other formula in here. This is a. Uh, this is in Australia. Uh, to place a study in context when I went there to do my postdoc, and this is a uh, different in situ networks that are that are there. We tried and um, we measure the whole region with different in situ and airborne measurements. And uh, this is a small acquisition, uh, post resolution. And this is the resulting one kilometer soil moisture after applying this linking model. And you can see that we are not capturing this gradient in here. So there's some variability, but it's not totally capturing the gradient. So we came up with the idea of adding also in this in this right part of the equation, adding the 
brainless temperature to strengthen the 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 use of microwaves in this in this modeling approach. And here you can see that if you add the brightness temperature, you are able to capture uh, the dynamic range of so much variability across the, the scene. Okay, so then I'll go into details later, but the approach consists on you have soil moisture at low resolution and you aggregate the high resolution to the low resolution and you solve this equation, you solve for the different coefficients. Once you have the coefficients, you apply the same linking model at high resolution. So you already have these two at high resolution and this one you resample. Okay, and using this procedure, you can go from the low resolution to the high resolution reasonably well. This is the, the maps of brightness temperatures that we use for this particular um, result experiment. This is the, we use Nasper temperature from MODIS, uh, Terra, and also NDVI from MODIS. Okay. So this is one possible uh, example of how to use the synergies in the different sensors uh, for the benefit of, of um, applications, because then we can, we can perhaps use this data. This is not okay, but this, this may fit the requirements. So um, we started there adding, adding brightness temperatures to the NDVI land surface temperatures uh, in space. Then we went on and instead of using one brightness temperature incidence angle and polarization, we uh, we saw that it was beneficial to add different angles and polarizations, so we um, evolved a little bit with the linking model here. We also explored different vegetation indices from models, so why using NDVI and not using, I don't know, um, another index which is closer to, to water, like the ND, NDWY, which is the influence in the algorithm, and, um, and improved it in the different steps. And then uh, we also apply the downscaling concept to urban observations. I'll show this uh, quickly in a minute. And then we, uh, the latest update was to, to extend the algorithm to move from a fixed uh, window to a moving window so that we could extend to other regions. Uh, we could actually go to Europe or worldwide. Not, uh, it's not a specific of, of the scene. And then uh, also we moved to use uh, model data for the land surface temperatures, so we could we could provide all weather products. Because if you see this, this is um, this day there were no clouds or very very few clouds. But if you have a lot of clouds, then you cannot obtain the high resolution. It's limited. Okay, and then um, of course we validated along the way the different products we collaborated. Um, very closely with the University of Salamanca, there's uh, in, in the Duero Basin in Spain, they, they actually uh, have a soil moisture network that is a uh, gold standard for validation of satellites. And this is a coarse resolution and a high resolution. And with them, we've also worked in the soil moisture agricultural drought index that use uh, the synergies of optical and and passive microwaves to get a uh, high resolution and a good index. And then on the other hand, to validate the products, another way of validating them is uh, through their use in application. So we collaborated with the uh, de Barcelona, for instance, and we saw that the soil moisture information at high resolution was useful for the prediction of wildfire stench. And so they, they could better plan where, how to deploy the different agents. Um, across the territory, if there was um, um, a higher fire risk. And uh, we also collaborated with uh, PREA, which um, is an ecology group and forestry group in Barcelona, well, in Catalonia, to study how the soil moisture influences forest die-off. So these are different, uh, different uh, applications in which we use the uh, level four product and we saw it, it was beneficial. And Islaine asks, 
What software do you use when processing soil moisture products? We mean what software or what programming language, I guess. It's uh, the, um, we generally use MATLAB for prototyping, although now we're more into Python. But then in the at back facilities, everything is in, in C++ because it's uh, it's operational and it needs to, it needs to be fast. And everything is in that language. I don't know if I answered your question. Is that what you mean as software? Is that a, a suggest? OK. And just a glimpse on the experimental flights that we perform. This is um, from the Cartographic Institute of Catalonia. They have this Cessna carbine, and it has two holes. So in one hole, we paste the um, uh, CASI and TASI hyperspectral sensors, so CASI for temperature, CASI for getting the NDVI. And in the other hole, we place the uh, UPC um, airborne Elvan radiometer. OK, you can see it here. And then we could measure, we could have the two and the two data streams at the same time and, and, and apply the algorithm. We adapted it just to make some moisture. And we ended up having a two meter, a two meter resolution with the downscaling. So without the downscaling, uh, the maps were had a resolution of 200 meters. So this is the primary temperature captured by the L1 radio meter. Error. Okay. Uh, this is latitude and longitude um, coordinates. This is from the NDVI from CASI. You can see there's a lot more detail, super, super um, high resolution. It's at two meters, you see a lot more than 200. You can see it clearly here. And um, LSD in here. And that would be the map of soil moisture retrieved using only the radiometer data. So from here to here, just using uh, an inversion of the tau omega model. Okay. And here you go to two meters uh, using this soil moisture as input and this land surface temperature and then the VI with the linking model that I showed. And you can see here, this is the final product, uh, the final product that we, we get. It's pretty reasonable. And we also explore this NDVI land surface temperature space in more detail with this slide. So you can see actually that in the, there's not always a triangle, okay, not always a triangle, but this is like a trapezoidal shape. And actually the pixels groups respond to different um, soil moisture clusters or uh, for instance, the rain fed all this region of rainfall was clustered up in here and all the irrigated was up in here. So, yeah, we were, uh, it was very nice to see everything that uh, we find detail, being used to see everything like at 25 kilometers is going to two meters. Uh, but we could, we could see that the, the linking model hold uh, across the different spatial scales, and that was the, 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 the message of these experiments. So I'll just go to introduce the, the, the actual algorithm that is now in operation, so the last version. It was developed by my PhD student, Gerard Portal, and um, let's, let's go for it. So there's, we have the passive microwaves. The good point is the high sensitivity of the L1, so we, have, we can get quantitative estimates. Um, this is semi-transparent, so we can retrieve um, soil moisture up to high vegetation densities. Atmospheric transparent, the bad part is this passive resolution, okay. Optical data, uh, they don't provide a direct measurement of soil moisture, but we saw that the land surface and the space reflected the soil moisture variations. And the optical data provides high high spatial resolution, which is uh, what we want. And the atmosphere not is not transparent. Okay. And then what what we end up doing? Okay. So this is NDVI, and this is land surface temperature for a good day, but this is for a bad day, very bad day. And so really, you cannot trust to provide high resolution soil moisture estimates daily. 
using only optical data. So we moved and we, for the NDVI, we can use an eight day composite and using at the eight day composite of the optical data, uh, there's no gaps usually because uh, it's, it's normally the composites of NDVI are done as a maximum value composite. So you just keep the value, the maximum value that you obtain for the period. So in eight days, it's total coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, but land surface temperature, we absolutely need the land surface temperature at the day of the satellite or microwave satellite observations. And we kind of do this kind of um, binning, temporal binning. So we went to the models and we can use um, the models. We have an intermediate resolution, nine kilometers, but it's constantly and continually improving. It's not affected by atmosphere vegetation. It's uh, in the end, it's a simulation. And uh, we, we saw that the LST space uh, reflects also so much variation. So LST and DVI space using this model, LST also reflected the variation. Okay, so we use Sarah Pipeline from the European Center of Weather of Workers. So this is, uh, this is how the algorithm, the mouse is not responding for some reason. Okay. But you hear me, right? Okay, no. <laughs> okay. And passive microwaves, we have passive microwaves on one hand, we have optical and we have the models. So what we do is that we need the SMOS data. From SMOS we use the level three is that is the soil moisture and we use the brightness temperatures, which is the, the level one. Okay, we have it at 25 kilometers and we use it, we enhance it a little bit to fill in the gaps because there are still some gaps in the level three. And we use it for the, large, uh, for the low resolution linking model. Okay. And then from the optical, uh, from the optical branches, we use the MODIS only. So the aggregation of eight days. And uh, we aggregate it to 25 kilometers and we get the RF5 land and nine kilometers are also aggregated to 25 kilometers. And with that, we are able to pose this uh, linear equation and solve for the coefficients. Okay, uh, we can solve it because we have more than one, two, three, four, five unknowns. Okay, and later we'll, we'll go into how many pixels do we need to get this model running and what's the, the actual window size that is optimal. Once we have these coefficients, we go and apply the same model with the data at high resolution. So the data, uh, the one kilometer data goes directly here the nine kilometer data is the real sample and the brightness temperature was most a real sample and we go to this high resolution model here. And uh, at the end of the way, we have the high resolution. So I'm not sure. Okay, so this is a um, very nice animation. Uh, thanks, uh, Gerard Portal, he, he did it. And this is a um, small Barcelona space center, the level three, so the soil moisture, original soil moisture, 25 kilometers. This is MODIS RST, uh, sorry, ERA5 RST, MODIS NDVI. This is the brightness temperature, horizontal polarization, vertical. We use the two of them at three different angles. This is one of the angles. And you can see uh, here is an animation of the different coefficients that we are getting. See that the window, the window is this. The window is adapting. It goes and it reaches the, yeah, when it reaches the coast, it adapts, you see? And then in the end, we are getting this high resolution soil moisture as a result. So the coefficients change, uh, change very much and this, we didn't uh, actually get uh, any physical understanding of how these coefficients were varying at all. But uh, you could just not get the average or anything and use a unique, a unique model for the whole region. So they need to be adaptive and adapt to each of the, to each of the, the local window. Okay. Regarding the size of the window, uh, we saw that it's adaptive. So if there's an inland area, those are the pixels that we keep, but if there's a coastal area, we only want to get the pixels that are on the coast. We are, we cannot retrieve so much from the ocean, right? And uh, the same, so this is like an illustration where there's a, uh, you will reach 
the coastal region. Uh, the size of the window is crucial to the accuracy. So uh, this is the original soil moisture. This is with a so-called optimal window that you get this parcel detail. And if this is too large, so the problem is you, you get, you choose a too large window, you, you lose the capability of looking at the details. Okay, so we chose an optimal window that maximizes the correlation and minimizes the center room in square root with respect to, to in situ. So in situ data that we had, we performed different experiments for a while to do that. So I'll just jump in, I have five minutes, <laughs> perhaps I need five more, but uh, I promise not to be too long. I just jump to the, the last part of my talk in which I'll be showing, uh, giving you a flavor of different, different uh, studies in which we combine machine learning with remote sensing. Uh, so my boy and my, my personal view is that these are different pieces of the puzzle and we can use and leverage from all of them to get the global picture and process understanding. So um, let's start, if you remember from the video at the very start, we have these data cubes. And uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, uses of machine learning is to, to extract, the, extract the information from that cubes, the most relevant information so that they are tractable. So, um, it's called, this is called dimensionality reduction. And the most popular methodology for that is the PCA, Principal Component Analysis, or EOF in, in physics. It's popular and it's, it's useful in many, in many situations, but it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't capture the, the nonlinear spatial temporal relations. And in earth science, we, uh, we are in, we are trying to capture nonlinear spatial temporal relations in most of the problems. So we came up with this idea of developing a method that is adaptive. It's a dimensionality reduction method that deals with nonlinearities, extracts spatial and temporal components, and um, we build the very first and final versions of it. And then it's uh, it's complex, so we we have the the, uh, the magnitude and the phase that's that's relevant, and it's rotated so the different components uh, may have may not be totally orthogonal, um, but they are more closely representing the physical phenomena. So there's, there's this publication, if you want to go to the, into details, I cannot spend a lot of time into it, but just get the, the idea that we have from the data cube, we extract um, temporal modes, and each temporal mode has spatial component associated. So this will be, for instance, the, if this is uh, one of the modes, it resembles an annual variability, and we see in which parts of the globe this annual variability is manifesting. Okay. So uh, here is a, an example of how to, to extract the information of a small data cube of six years. So global, the global maps of the Earth daily uh, spatial resolution, six years. And we use this, this rock PCA. So we saw that uh, with the four first components, you, you when you, you obtain a component, and you see the, um, how much explained variance of the data it represents. So the first component was 70, uh, most, more than 70% of the variability. This is the spatial representation and this is the temporal. So this, um, by visual inspection, it's, it's like the annual variability. You, you should, well, one can expect that the annual variability, uh, the annual cycle and the uh, rotation is driving this um, this mode. Then, uh, as the second component was spending the 13%, third component around 10, and the fourth component around 4. So, with with four components, we were almost spending 100% of the um, of the variability in the data cube. And this is much easier to handle than the whole um, the whole data cube uh, complete. So now we just have four main components with their spatial and temporal representations. Here in the in, here is the, we are grouping the spatial pixels per, uh, per climate. Okay, so as you see that, for instance, the first, uh, the first, this is the annual oscillation, 
and in the in the boreal this uh, in the Golean equatorial this is the um, where are the most uh, the, the regions that are manifesting this uh, this mode. Uh, the second is decisional oscillation, this one. And decision, decisional oscillation is in here. And then the second is mostly in the boreal and croplands. Okay, you can see this one. And the, and the, this is the interannual trend. Okay, you can see this, there's not a periodic fluctuation or anything. This is, uh, sorry, this is the temporal scale. So this was intriguing because the uh, interannual trend of soil moisture, uh, it looked like a little bit like the El Niño Southern Oscillation uh, fluctuation. So we, look, we wanted to look at it a little bit further in detail. So what is El Niño, El Niño Southern Oscillation? Um, and develops uh, Niño episodes every three to seven years, but the frequency and intensity vary on interdecadal time scales. This is a very difficult phenomenon to predict, but it, can, it has wide consequences worldwide. And uh, the regions of the Earth that are affected by these El Niño episodes are generally put in a map and called Enso teleconnections. We'll, we'll have a look at those later. So El Niño, uh, El Niño is measured by different indices which are calculated uh, with, uh, as sea surface temperature anomalies in the Pacific Ocean. So there are different indices, Nino 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, which are different boxes to define these anomalies. And then for instance, if there is a Nino, there's a really, really a high anomaly in the Pacific, whereas if it's the opposite is the Nino is a negative anomaly. See here, so across the years, there's different niño states, niña states, and when they, uh, when the El Niño anomaly goes beyond two, this is uh, starting to be uh, um, manifesting in the different uh, regions of the world. So there could be a Niño, 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 and this would be a super intense one. So we just correlated the Niño index. You can see here, for instance, is the end so forth. This is the Niño index, and we correlated it with the with the soil moisture interannual trend, this one here. Okay. Um, with this one in blue. And then you can see that uh, for different uh, ENSO index, indexes, the correlation was around 06 or 08, which was very high. And we could, we could also compute the lag. Okay, so how much time it passes uh, from the ENSO, from the anomaly in the Pacific to the uh, manifestation in the different, uh, in, the, in the soil moisture worldwide, okay. Um, okay, so if we look at the map of the, of the, of this interannual, uh, interannual component, and we correlate, uh, we compute the correlation uh, per pixel, we get a pretty high correlations uh, in the two directions, right? So when there's an ENSO, there's wetter places than normal. When there's an ENSO, there's drier places than normal. And this is the map of teleconnections that I was telling you about, uh, about before. This is um, this is for, from the past ENSO episodes. So when there's an ENSO, there's, uh, some parts of the planet become drier and for instance, uh, you, may, uh, you may remember all the forest fires in Indonesia. And there's, there's wet a lot of uh, problems in South America when there's a, a Niño too, and also in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So this is what is, uh, what is generally uh, accepted as um, so influences. And in our map, we can see that the wet pattern, for instance, in the Gulf of Mexico, and um, Argentina and in this in Central Africa, those are consistent. Okay, and we can see the dry patterns here in Indonesia and also in South Africa, to more or less uh, manifest as uh, this map says. But we also see some 
new wave patterns, which are in tri game. We see a um, very high correlation point. So when there's an, an ENSO, there's a uh, more rain in here, so the status of the soil it is, it is much wetter. And we also see some, some regions that appear to manifest drier patterns when there's an ENSO. Okay, so Eastern Australia and these regions here. But this is also be taken with caution because um, still we're only using six years of satellite data. Um, so the, the patterns and then the annual variability that we'll be getting is, is only capturing one ENSO episode, okay? So, but it's still interesting. But can we say that from this map, there's a causal relation? So it's actually ENSO causing this soil moisture variability, we don't know. We're just, we're just um, talking about uh, correlation. So uh, I now introduce briefly uh, the concept of causal inference. So causal inference is, is a very powerful approach uh, to deal with, um, uh, with all kinds of problems in AI, but especially for earth sciences, it allows us to go beyond correlation analysis. So I'll just introduce uh, an approach, um, an approach that, uh, that is very intuitive. Um, as, an as an illustration of what's causality and it's Granger causality. Okay, so Granger causality just tests whether the past of X is useful to predict the future of Y. So we have Y and X, and we want to see if this X causes Y. Okay, so then what we do, simply this will be the linear version. We have a variable Y, and we want to predict this future from its past, and we fit this regression model. And we have some residuals, okay, from the predictions. Then we perform another regression in which the future of Y is expressed as the past of Y, but also the past of T, okay? And we account for the residuals. So intuitively, if these residuals that account from the past of X are lower than these residuals, then there is a causal uh, then there is a causal relation. X thing we can say that X causes uh, Y. Okay, and then we compute the ratio uh, to see um, causality index. So we developed a, a nonlinear approach and adapted it to earth science. This uh, actually uh, in the slides when you see that it have all these. All these applications, we provide the code. Really, if you go to um, the web page of the lab, you can just, it's ready to use. So then, by using this uh, Ranger causality, we could look at the map of the, um, of the, um, of the interannual soil moisture, and having the ENSO information, having the ENSO index and the soil moisture interannual component, we can see in red, we mark the regions in which actually ENSO was causing soil moisture according to this Ranger causality framework. And in blue, the ones in which ENSO was not causing soil moisture. Okay, so scatter. So then we can actually say that these are the soil moisture driver patterns caused, caused by ENSO. And this is a much powerful result. And then we can just go and, for instance, see if these patterns, these new patterns, um, uh, explore them and if they actually in more detail because it's not just a correlation it's a causation okay so and uh, the lab was between 15 and 85 days i'm just going a lot beyond the time let me just go quickly if that's okay i have a i'll just respond the questions in the end otherwise we're very late um, I'm going to measuring soil moisture persistence with, uh, with microwave products. So <clears throat> if you recall this exponential decay, we can actually investigate the soil moisture memory and its variation across the globe using the microwave soil moisture products. Okay. Um, how? Well, it's important because if there's a wet soil moisture anomaly and it persists a lot, it translates into the atmosphere and increases heat. If it's, persist, if it's persistence is lower, 
then it may not influence the plant surface interchange. Um, so this is a relevant uh, this is a relevant product, um, product or information used in, in many models. So one way of measuring the, the persistence of soil moisture time series is to calculate its autocorrelation. Okay, to calculate its autocorrelation. And um, and um, estimate the crossing of this autocorrelation curve with the one divided by the by e. Okay, and the time, the time lag is exactly uh, it's a, it gives an approximation uh, an approximation of the persistence of the soil moisture anomalies in, in the soil. Okay, so a high value would mean long persistence and the low value will be short persistence. Okay, but this is a very nice approach, but in practice, when you calculate the autocorrelation of, of satellite time series, there's a lot of gaps. There's non-uniform nature of the uh, observation data in general. So for many reasons, you may end up having a few gaps or different uh, noise and figures in different areas of the planet. And for that, we developed, a, we can calculate the autocorrelation in the spectrum and uh, it, we deal better with these gaps. And we, we propose these uh, two approaches based on this square set the sparse solution called LASSO. And we compared it with the uh, naive estimation, which means, okay, I compute the autocorrelation among the less of the gaps. You just compute them. And then it's, you can see here the profiles are very noisy. And with the two, with our proposed uh, estimators, it's very just more smooth. And then if we do uh, denoising, it's just more uniform. So the, the error by taking a measure from the autocorrelation is lower. So what we did is just uh, for each pixel, okay, we calculate the crossing, we calculate the autocorrelation and the crossing and estimate this default in time. And we did it for all the pixels on, in the peninsula. This is with one of the methods. This is with one of the other methods. And this is with the naive approach of not taking into account the gaps. You can see that the choice of the autocorrelation estimator and metric has a deep impact in the results. But, um, but this is a, the difference between LS and LASSO is, is mainly a bias, so it's not uh, super critical. But differences with naive as are, are really um, important. So it, it, uh, it is it is key to take into account the non-uniform data of the of the observations almost in all uh, in all applications. But uh, with machine learning approaches, you are able to do that um, to deal with gaps. I'll show another example in the in the next slide. And then uh, we we could compare the persistent patterns of the different sensors. So it's a uh, L band, the C band. Passive and active, I also computed with the ASCAP. And you can see that persistent patterns are consistent. And you can also go and see, okay, what's this spatial variability? What is this spatial variability? Is this spatial variability related to the soil moisture content on average? And if this is a more or less, there seems to be a relation that the, the lower persistence uh, occurs at a Low at middle soil moisture content values, but these we we aim at doing this exercise worldwide, so we have wide variability, um, and then our results will be more representative. Uh, well, this is about uh, crop yield estimation. We saw that with um, with this POD, we were able to follow crop progress, and we developed different seasonal metrics. Um, for crop yield estimation. So generally, optical indices are used for crop yield estimation and the optical indices, uh, from the optical indices, there's just one metric that is computed. For instance, the, the integral, that would be this one, between the minimum and the maximum, the full integral, the maximum, yes, the maximum, or just different metrics. So what we did in this work here, if we compare the the metrics obtained with EBI with the metrics obtained, which is an optical index, 
with the metrics obtained with the BOD. And uh, we saw that it, it was actually beneficial to integrate the two information, the two <coughs> data streams for, the, for crop yield prediction. And it was also beneficial not only to use a metric, a single metric. For instance, this is a metric, a synergistic metric, which is just accounting for the time lag between a maximum of FEB and maximum of BOD. So the time lag of the, for the maximum correlation. <coughs> And it was actually explaining a greater part of the variability. But it was more beneficial even to use the synergy of all the time series. And to be able to deal with this account, this uh, massive amount of data, you need a machine learning approach. And this is the results for the, uh, we got for different <coughs> approaches. So linear regression is this dash. This, uh, Linear regression is in is the dash ones and um, nonlinear regression, so uh, kernel in solid lines. So you can see that when you use the synergy, the synergy of the two sensors, both the linear and the nonlinear provide good results even in April when the season is starting. So harvest is in October. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> But then using only optical is not performing really well at the beginning. And what is important is to see that there's a plateau. There's a plateau uh, about July, so four months before harvest, when we can get the best results. And best results are, you, are obtained using uh, the two uh, EV and BOD sensors, so optical and microwaves. So best results in terms of R square and Rubin square error. Okay, so in all the approaches that we have also in the, that we use in this paper are also, are also in our GitHub and we publish these results if you are more interested in that. Um, going a little uh, one step further into interpretability, once we have a model fitted, okay, we can uh, try to understand the model. We fit the model with a super powerful machine learning approach and we just get good estimates, but we want to understand <clears throat> more about this model. So one, I wanted to show this an illustration of how can we obtain the relevance of the predictable variables once you, you have a fitting model. So this is for the whole US. <coughs> we fitted a model with five variables. Optical index, microwave index, BOD, soil moisture from microwaves to maximum temperature or precipitation. And we fitted it with linear regression, random forest, and Gaussian processes. We obtained the results with Gaussian processes, as you can see, in terms of R and also uh, RMC. And uh, we were interested in knowing which are the features that are more relevant for the model. And to do that, there's um, a two-step procedure. So what we can do is, for each feature, we set it zero to set to zero its values for a training sample, and then evaluate the prediction RMSC RMS for that uh, for that scenario. Okay, and that can be cast as its sensitivity or relevance. Uh, so the higher the the RMSC, the more relevant is it, it is for the model to have that variable. And then you can normalize uh, the rankings. And here we are, we're just plotting the feature relevance. And from visual inspection, we can see that the soil moisture is the most relevant variable, followed by EBI. And then there's VOD and Pmax and Prezip for the different, uh, different crops. So just uh, to give you a flavor. And then to conclude, and uh, I'm sorry, it was longer than I expected. Um, I just wanted to go a little bit more into the gap filling. Gap filling is important. Then you want to use the observations and um, sometimes the linear approximation is not enough for fill the gaps or just uh, there are more sophisticated ways to fill the gaps. And it's interesting if you can use different sensors which are measuring the same variable to fill the gaps. And this is what I illustrate here, in which we have the smalls 
Aska Tanamse 2. So Aska, I remember, is a C1 active uh, sensor. Tanamse 2 is a C1 passive and small cell one passive. So we have the three satellites which are in orbit and each one has different gaps. So the observations are in orange. And if, if we focus in here, in this, in this orange square, you can see that at this point, there was only SMOS capturing a rain event, but neither ASCAT or AMSER2 were capturing uh, this event. But by using the three information, the three flows of information into a multi output framework, both the prediction of ASCAT and AMSER2 goes up. They go up because uh, they don't have information that day, but they know from the other sensor that there was a rain event. So it, that the information is transferred across the sensors. Um, also, the, what, what I like a lot about Lassian processes in particular is that they capabilities to provide uncertainty bounds. So as you see here, for instance, uh, this, uh, this period, the AMSA2 satellite didn't have any data and it was, um, it was acquiring the, the observation from the other two sensors and then the uncertainty bounds uh, increase accordingly. Okay, so this is, I think there's a lot of power in information fusion of different different satellites for gap filling and, and other, uh, and a lot of applications. And, and then um, for the very last, I just wanted to mention that this also process, if you know about the physical, the physical, um, the physical model underlying in the system, uh, you can try to, to force it. So for instance, in the case of soil moisture, we know that the main force affecting soil moisture is precipitation. Okay. And then there are losses, which are evapotranspiration, drainage, and runoff. But um, if we assume that there's only evapotranspiration, and we are in what is called stage two, we can approximate the water balance equation by an ordinary differential equation, okay? And, uh, and then we can impose that the Gaussian process is following uh, this ODE, and by that we can learn the latent one latent force, okay? And then we can also learn the parameters of the of the equation. And in particular, those parameters are related to soil hydraulic properties and to this evolving, evolving time. And you can see here below the Latin force. So in orange, in, in blue, is in situ precipitation from a particular network that was not used in the, in the process, okay? And in orange, there's the, the Latin force and the Latin force resembles precipitation. So by modeling soil moisture and imposing this ODE, we are able to extract information of precipitation. So that's, yeah, that's also very interesting. So that's a way to imposing, or trying to, to use the physics uh, to learn, learn more about the system. And, and that's it, I just wanted to finish. Uh, there's a one question. Uh, Chanchilin, could there be any influence on the, of the one uh, 11 year solar cycle on the soil moisture? Some data suggests that the intensive precipitation events are correlated with the solar cycle. That's an interesting aspect. Uh, I'm not aware that this has been studied, but it's interesting. It may be, it may be. So some of the, some of the variability that is not explained by Enzo could perfectly be due to the solar cycle, or we can try to, to, to find some correlation with the different features. Okay. Monsif asked, what are the best ways to collect good radar images? So I explained today radiometric images. It's not radar images. Radar images is, um, um, there are active sensors which emit and receive um, and process the received um, signal. So you you refer to Sentinel-1, for instance, that's radar and it's in Google Earth Engine. 
if you refer to radiometric uh, images, I think there's a uh, SMAP data. SMAP data is in Google Earth Engine. BOD data is not there yet, as, as far as I know. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. So yes, take home messages, and I'm sorry for the delay. I just wanted to, yeah, to say that this new, new observational area, this is a golden age for Earth observation. And uh, I saw how microwaves are useful in this Earth observation constellation. They allow measuring the water resource and vegetation. And uh, I saw um, how we can extract the information from microwaves and retrieve by their physical variables, not only so moisture, but also this BOD. I saw how to spread multi-sensor synergies and a little bit of hybrid modeling, so using data and models. And uh, some going work and opportunities, I just say that uh, it is a perfect moment to advance to a current understanding of the system process, processes with the with the new new evidence and the data that we have at hand, and to address crucial climate questions. And and that's it. Oh, one one more question: Could you picture safe in all this? Would it be possible to interpret it with all the variables? Of course, of course, uh, fluorescence um, will be a relevant variable to study vegetation. And uh, we're yeah, we're actually very very um, interested in exploiting the synergies of all the vegetation variables. So uh, greenness, fluorescence, water content, biomass. So there's just a lot of powerful combinations there. Yeah. There are some books of this program. What program do you mean? Do you mean uh, radiometry in general? There's, um, there's, there's many, many reviews that you can you can access and there's uh, the book that we have as a reference is from Ulavi. I have it here actually. This is awesome. Right? Uh, super this high interaction. Good. This is interactive <laughs> session. <laughs> I don't see myself but you can see the book. Yes, yes. I mean I, I see you in, in a small box but uh, eventually. Well, so this microwave radar and radiometer sensing, this is the book that uh, is useful, the basics. And then I will just use the reviews, uh, different reviews uh, for the state of the art. 